Hi everyone and thanks so much for joining this webinar today. Obviously it's, it's going to be covering a number of different aspects um, on preparing to get your business ready for equity crowdfunding and um, just in you know just uh, introducing myself my name is Robin Holt I'm a senior campaign manager here and you may also see that you've, we've got Alan Crabb who is a co-founder here at Virtual. So thank you very much for everybody everybody for joining. What we're really going to be covering in this webinar here um, is a number of different topics that everybody needs to consider when it comes to equity crowdfunding and being successful. But before we just kick into that, what I want to just highlight is the Q&A feature, which we're going to be monitoring throughout. But most of, the top, most of these questions we'll try and leave until the end. But if you do have any questions at any point in time, please click on the Q&A button, um, ask your question in there, and we will be going through these in detail and depth at the end of the webinar. So just to kick things off here, I think it's really, really essential for every single company to be considering the preparation that goes into an equity crowdfunding campaign. Because here at Virtual, we've now had 40 successful offers. And every single one of those offers will tell you that preparation is absolutely key and vital to success. So in putting together this webinar here, we've actually broken down a number of these contents and um, here for you to, to really just explain and highlight the virtual process from a promotional perspective. So we're not gonna go into the legal aspects in this webinar um, today, but we're really gonna be talking through the virtual process, the social media following that you really need to have and the engagement that you have and the right content that you need to have, then the digital advertising and, and really the effectiveness of that in your equity crowdfunding campaign, your email list, things like media and press, and also very importantly, your marketing expertise within your team. So just to kick this all off, just trying to go over to the next slide. One of the points here, which I'd like to highlight is that our virtual dashboard has had so many changes recently and it's really, um, it's really helped. And we've, we spent so much time on it this year to try and help other companies to raise successfully through the process and have a number of resources here. But Alan, since you led this project, I think I'd love to hand this over to you to talk through not only the virtual dashboard, but also the virtual process. So over to yourself, Alan. Uh, thanks, uh, Robin, and, and thanks everyone for joining us, actually. Thanks for a great turnout, actually, to, to listen to us uh, talking through our process that obviously we've been working on and refining, actually, over the last two years. Uh, with many of the deals that we've raised for, I say so. I think, as of um, I think yesterday, uh, we had our uh, 40, 40 first uh, successful raise uh, through virtual, and uh, as you would guess, uh, we've been getting better and better at this as, as we go um, with this new regime. Um, I think there was there's a degree of of learning in terms of uh, getting it right and getting the process right, and we've been refining it, and obviously bringing it into the platform and, and online to give Swiss founders and anybody looking at this regime as a uh, guide to what, what's needed uh, from, from a company's perspective to get things off the ground. So, um, so just kicking off, I think in terms of the process, I think it's better to give you an overview of just our um, process um, that, we've been, that we've pretty much refined now um, more recently. And um, it, maybe just Robin, just go on to the next slide so that I can demonstrate just the, the, oh, the each, each stage. Yeah, there we go. Um, so, so there's three key steps um, to our eight to 10 week process for raising capital through virtual. Um, the first step is the, the pre-launch phase, and this is the planning and, and preparing for um, what is, is pretty much a, a marketing campaign, uh, which we would call the EOI. And then thirdly, um, preparing then to open an offer. Um, and during this session, um, we, we are looking at more of the marketing and promotion aspects of uh, running a equity crowdfunding offer on virtual, rather than, than maybe some of the work in, do, in, in preparing the offer document and then legals um, behind the offer when it does go live. So I, I think um, this, if you keep in mind that this is, is more of a promotion um, and I suppose early, the, the early stages of what's required to, to plan for what we call a, an EOI launch uh, for an offer. So um, as, as you can see here, we, we aim to um, take two to three weeks 
uh, to prepare and, and plan uh, for that EOI launch. Uh, that EOI launch and the campaign runs for three to four weeks, uh, typically, and uh, the offer itself typically runs for three to four weeks. And this timeline is, is what we would actually recommend as the, um, as the timeline that you work to and ensure that you meet some of these key deadlines and dates as well. So, um, so just um, stepping into, I suppose, the dashboard, we've looked at checklists for each stage of this process as well. Um, and this is a, is a, a basic screenshot of what the, the first checklist looks like in, in, in preparing the content. Um, and uh, that, that pretty much covers, I suppose, what the overview of, of our process is. Um, the purpose of this process is um, to, I suppose, at the early stage, ensure that you've got everything lined up um, for pretty much what looks like a, a six to eight week, um, sorry, a, a, six week, a six to eight week process of campaigning. So getting early interest and also setting up the potential of getting early momentum for when an raise does open to the public. Um, everything we do is, is about de-risking um, the brand or the, uh, or the reputation or the risk of um, not being able to do a capital raise, even if you're not quite successful in getting the traction that you need at the early stages or if you're not getting the interest that you receive during the, the early phases of the marketing of the offer. So um, everything we do is, is about de-risking reputation or even just the perception of how well the, the, the raise is per performing. So, um, and, and during this, like uh, next 15 to 20 minutes, we'll just cover every aspect of marketing that looks to give you the best chance of success and, and hopefully the best chance of meeting your maximum target that you set yourself. Um, and we'll talk through that process as well because we have a lot of data from our campaigns that will guide you right throughout the process to de-risk even setting up what level of um, offer that you might open to the public with through equity crowdfunding. So, um, so I think we'll kick off just on the first aspect of, of preparing and planning. Um, and also one of the most critical aspects uh, we find um, with uh, running a campaign um, on virtual, um, and that's social media. Um, so I'll maybe hand it over back to, to Robin, who's very experienced in this area. I see Robin himself I see, is probably the most experienced or is the most experienced campaign manager in Australia. Um, and it comes from the UK, as you can tell from the accent. Um, he has had uh, several years experience in the UK, working with um, a lot more companies than, than what we've even hosted through virtual. And, and we'll give you some insight into what he has learned, particularly around social media and some aspects of the marketing. So Robin, um, over to you. Um, what, what do you need to know about uh, the setup and uh, the content that's required from a social media perspective? Well, I, uh, I hope I'd meet some expectations after <laughs> that introduction, but thanks, Alan. I think um, you're absolutely right. When it comes to the process, we've built this out. So we really want to be able to give businesses the best chance of success. And that's really what this webinar is all about, because on the promotional side, social media is absolutely essential for businesses being able to find out more about you, what you represent, who you are as a business, and really what your backstory is. And social media and the right content kind of go hand in hand. So that's really why we are um, focusing on these two elements and really just discussing these here. But I would say that when it comes to social media, a lot of companies come to us and say, you know, what kind of, how, how, how big does my social media, media following need to be before I go an equity crowdfund? Um, and, you know, what, you know, what metrics do I need to meet here? And I don't think that that's what we should be asking. I think it really should be about what level of engagement you have with your own community. And that ties hand in hand with the content, which I'll cover, but really I would far rather and be much more comfortable in working with a company directly that has perhaps even you know a thousand followers across all platforms but 200 of those people were heavily engaged with the actual business itself and really really you know interested to follow its journey and the founders themselves were very good 
at demonstrating that they really thought about the brand and thought about the messaging that they were pushing out for the company itself. So I think it's always essential that a company really does consider a number of these different platforms. But when it comes to equity crowdfunding, we don't necessarily, we're not tied to any of these platforms and saying and suggesting that you should be using one or the other because some businesses have huge success, particularly in the food space with something like Pinterest, and that drives a huge amount of traffic to their website. And so we can see, you know, any, any platform, any which one of these platforms, which works best for you in building your following. And for a while it's been Instagram, but you know, the, the engagement has been dropping off for that. And so much more recently, we've seen platforms like TikTok, which so many people have jumped on. We haven't yet seen a very strong conversion in a TikTok following to investment yet. So it's really unpredictable whether or not that that's going to be valuable for an equity crowdfunding campaign. But you can bet that if you're focusing on engagement with your users and with your customers, then that's really what's going to win you over and help you raise funds for an equity crowdfunding campaign. You don't want people to be surprised about what you're putting out there. Because when I you know, very recently spoke to um, Ben from Indigo Power, he'd been mentioning that he was going to look to equity crowdfund um, for a long time before he actually went out and pushed this message out. So it's really important that your social media makes you look established and does have a good level of engagement and you've been spending some good time on this. Personally, I would actually look to, if you're a young business and you're very new on social media, personally, I would focus a lot of your effort on TikTok. And when it comes to TikTok, the right content is key. It's all video. And that's where Facebook and, and Instagram have all been pushing their message, pushing that type of content. Because if you've even got a very small um, community and level of engagement, Facebook and Instagram are going to be pushing your content if it's video based. So get in front of the camera, talk about your business, really share your journey. So people have a relative face to be able to put your business to the founder themselves. So always, always use video messaging. Now, when it comes to talking about your investment offer, there's a lot to actually share here. So we always think that clear messaging is pretty key and just identifying to people what you're looking to do. So at any point in time, if you look at the instrument investment offer here, at this point, we've actually still explained what the business does because it really, sometimes I can see messages which get pushed out there, which get straight to the point and just say, we're raising funds, invest in us now. And that's really not going to engage with people regularly and, and, and likely see a strong conversion rate because you just haven't taken the time to express why you're raising funds and what's so interesting about your business. Now, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, you can see James from Outland Denim who has done something like that after he's actually pushed out, me pushed out message after message, which is really focused on why they're raising funds. And he's, instead of just using a stock image, he's got in front of the camera and has talked about why it's so exciting. The same with Zerali in the top right-hand corner. They have done a great job of engaging with their crowd and really sharing the right kind of message. Um, so I would always encourage everybody to get in front of the camera, really story tell, use a call to action in every instance that you can and use the right call to action. So don't just um, you know, put an image up there and take advantage of the fact that you've got some, use some social proofing metrics and traction. And when you get all of this right, I firmly believe that the advertising itself is easier because you've got the content right. And I'd love to hand this over to yourself, Alan. You worked so heavily on the Outland Denim campaign, which was really going on during this pandemic. And it was just a fantastic job and success for not only Outland Denim, but ourselves because of the fact that we work so closely on this one. So I'd love to hand this over to yourself, Alan, um, if we go on to the next slide, which is digital advertising. So please, could you perhaps just break down what's important when it comes to digital advertising and what platforms you would recommend that people um, take a look at for being successful? Um, so, yeah, thanks, uh, Robin. Just in terms of social, I think it's, uh, 
it's very important as the as, as part of digital advertising to to think about social and the amplification of social through digital advertising and uh, one of the, the biggest lessons that we've learned as to due to the the campaign nature of uh, the eoi uh, running for a three-week period and also the the campaign nature of the offer itself when it goes live is that uh, we have a time period where we can be very effective actually at, at using digital advertising and particularly social digital advertising in a way to, I suppose, get the message across very quickly um, to uh, firstly, the audience of your own community. And then secondly, um, in, in targeting potentially other um, um, that would be more likely to actually be to resonate with that brand. Um, because we have a clear guide, hopefully through the planning phase, we understand who the, who the audience is, like who, what's the persona of the, the, uh, the customer. Um, because we typically find it, it's very similar, I think, when it comes to investment. Um, you really want that a emotive engagement with uh, that audience. And generally, it's the same or very similar audiences to the customers um, that you that you hopefully are drawing to your website um, or your social platforms on a day-by-day -day basis anyway. So um, if I break down digital advertising, we've got social. Um, we've also got um, what you would say is, is display advertising and, and Google would probably be the biggest um, platform for this. And then, sec and then thirdly is um, search um, and SEM. So um, ensuring that if, for example, you do get coverage, you do get um, publicity, um, or you're um, talking and, and getting good traction through social, that you're also able to pick up people that are searching for you as well through Google or uh, through other channels. So, um, so looking at uh, the three, um, we have found that Facebook and Instagram is probably the, well, not probably, it, it is the most cost effective channel to get traffic and conversions. And what I mean by conversions is that we can track people that are coming through these networks uh, directly to the website and then uh, subsequently registering their interest at the EOI stage. And then subsequent to the EOI, the offer period where they're actually making an investment. So we're tracking a conversion of an investor and we're also tracking the amount that that investor is bringing in. So you can clearly see like from a performance marketing perspective um, the cost of acquisition for the early stage of interest, and then subsequently the cost of an investor through these channels. So you can start to actually work out and, and budget um, for, for these campaigns. What we've also learned is that by using these, I suppose this very specific campaign periods to do these campaigns, we're also learning that uh, it's creating much more broad awareness, particularly for companies that are not using social media and some of the digital advertising channels um, as, as maybe as uh, widely as, as we use ourselves, but they're creating much more awareness of the brand and the products. And some companies, for example, Outland, have seen a, like a, a pretty dramatic increase, actually, in the people that are coming to their website and actually purchasing product as well. So, um, so that all ties in. And it's also keeping in mind, like in terms of budgeting for a campaign with with equity crowdfunding, you are actually potentially building a more of awareness for the brand and the products that you, you provide or the services that you provide as well as, as, as the, uh, the promotion of the advertising, or sorry, as, as well as the investment opportunity in the brand. So I, I like to say that we're an indirect way of marketing the product and service and also telling your story as well for the, for the brand. So, and, and you always get benefits from hopefully not only investment, but also increased um, business um, and revenues through, the, through uh, your other channels. Um, I'll cover just basically the, um, the ways that we typically use the other means of advertising. So the likes of uh, display, um, we use it at key periods during the campaigns um, as simple reminders of um, what stage you're at and some key messages. So for example, close, closer to the end of your EOI um, or at the launch of your offer or at the end of your offer, we may put uh, some budget into advertising where it could be displayed hopefully in 
some of the publications, the popular publications in Australia through that, uh, the, the, the Google Display Network. Um, and then thirdly is, um, as I mentioned earlier, AdWords, um, putting in a simple, like a, a regular budget throughout the campaign. And, and we do this from our end as well, but picking up key terms, key um, uh, keywords within the campaign, particularly around investment, has um, been able to result in, in conversions as well. And we can see that at each stage of the campaign as well. So, um, Robin, I, I, uh, I took a bit longer than I expected on this, but I think it's one of the critical ones. So um, I'll maybe move on to the next aspect, um, which is um, emails and comms as the, another critical aspect to success. So um, how big, Robin, do you think um, your email lists, for example, needs to be? And how effective or how should you use emails throughout this campaign process? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think emails is, is probably one of the most effective, if not the most effective method of actually transferring your audience into investors because of the fact that they've already gone through the process of learning about your business, that they've become a subscriber. But when it does come to an email list about which you have within your business, consistency is absolutely key. So if you have a list, you need to be sending out a newsletter, whether it be once every week or once every two weeks or even once every month, just so that people are familiar with your message and who you are. Now, if you come to us and you don't have an email list, you're missing out on the opportunity to be able to actually go to this list and see some really strong engagement and strong conversions. So if you're perhaps out there and just looking for maybe two to 300K, it's not gonna be so much of an issue to have a smaller list, um, but when it does come to the size of the raise that you're actually looking to achieve, a big list is definitely going to matter. But that engagement piece is always, always key. And I think that that engagement comes from being very consistent and being very uh, aware of the message that you're pushing out to people and making it enjoyable and exciting for people to engage with and read. So if you take a look at, and I know I'm going back to per se, you know, um, other examples, but um, maybe I'll use a different example from Indigo Power actually, but I'll use Zerali for instance, which was a, a great campaign that managed to hit its maximum target. It was only 300K, but they managed to raise that from over 500 investors. And they did that because they went out to this audience well before they launched their expression of interest campaign and said that something was happening in the business, something exciting was coming. And they had a really, really strong message and brand presence. So they were very, um, they were very diligent in the way that they actually delivered that message. So I think that it absolutely matters to be very consistent and be sending something out regularly so people really know what they're getting into and understand that equity crowdfunding is an opportunity for people to invest into your business. Because if you send out one email and it says, we've done this as a business from day one, we're growing and we're raising investment. This is equity crowdfunding. This is how you can get involved. Go to virtual. It's too many messages in one email. You have to break it down. And so what we've done for you is we built out a number of different templates and they're going to be in the link there, which I'll send to you after this webinar. So you can actually um, use a lot of these email templates yourself for your own launch. But I, I do also, I, I would love to break down and understand the businesses here who um, are joining us just to really understand where your email list is at. So we can really offer some more tailored advice to you. But I think even, um, you know, moving on from the email list, it's, it's such a strong conversion piece, but the next piece is, is really important, that's, and that's press. And I think that we've got to ask whether or not a business should be getting press because it's sometimes forgotten about, especially in equity crowdfunding, um, when it's not always considered as a top priority. But Alan, you've worked very closely with some campaigns this year who have gained significant press, Seabin and Outlaw have gained significant press. So do you really need to have a strong strategy here while your equity crowdfunding campaign is going on? And what are the other benefits of getting some good press for your business? 
let me just unmute. Um, so <laughs> yeah. press, yeah, like it's, it's one aspect to the campaign that just heightens the profile, not only of the brands, but also of the founders as well. Like, um, I think it's, it's one investment I think that you should consider as part of this campaign. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be all centered around the equity raise, but at the end of the day, like during the phase where you're marketing the offer and the opportunity to invest, like you do want to leverage any press and coverage that you do get throughout that, that period. And I think what at the very early stages of our process, like we, it's one of the key items that we, we address and, and make sure that we, we know exactly the key messaging of, of what we want to, um, to release, like particularly to um, some key, um, what I would say is the key um, targets for press for uh, an investment opportunity. So um, the first one is like within your own industry, you do want to raise awareness of what you're doing. Um, because generally the people in your industry will, will, will understand a bit about the brand and, and what you're trying to do. And, and that will hopefully create word of mouth as well. So, um, so one of the, the key aspects of the early stages is work out your, your key messaging. Um, and then I suppose ensure that you know what audiences that you want to target with that. So um, I mentioned about industry, but we also need to consider what angle or pitch that we want to have for the mainstream press. So we could have something like something timely um, in terms of what's, uh, what's in the news cycle at the moment um, or what's relevant. Like it, for example, at the moment, like we're, we're going through um, pretty unprecedented times with this pandemic, but what is the relevant story as to for you as a founder or for the brand itself in the mainstream? Because as you would guess, like, um, a lot of people are, are very interested in these news items, particularly and how small local businesses are potentially affected by this. Um, and that also ties into what I've got here is small business press as well. So um, there is lots of publications or even certain sections of, of the mainstream publications that do cover stories um, about small business. And it's, it's thinking about um, what um, outlets might cover this or what sections of the mainstream press may cover you as a story of this. Um, generally, um, lots of publications don't tend to allow links through to your plot, to your campaigns, uh, which is quite frustrating. Uh, some may do it, um, but uh, you, you generally need to know the, the people behind the stories or the journalists behind the stories to, to manage to sneak these here links in because generally online publications want people to stay on their website and the same way that social media do too as well. So, um, so the, the way that we use press is, is generally about amplifying it through digital advertising or through social organically. So, um, and all of these things all tie together. So um, when you start to prepare the campaign and the content and the digital uh, designs and uh, every, the collateral that goes around with the campaign, you're, you're also thinking about any press coverage as content that you can share um, through each of these channels and hopefully amplify. And what we've learned actually particularly um, is that um, with digital advertising, your press coverage and any of the posts that are associated with this generally are the most successful in terms of conversion. So the most successful in terms of bringing traffic, uh, raising the profile and also converting um, the most number of investors and usually I said the most investment as well. So um, an example of this just today, I, say, I, I spoke to a company that's looking to launch uh, very soon, I say, and uh, one of their larger investors was not um, at the stage of committing. Um, and obviously with the time ticking, there was, there was a, a degree of uncertainty of whether like this large investor would come in. Um, and it wasn't until um, they got a few um, mainstream articles in, in the press that this investor was, was sold and, and, and came in um, as part of the campaign. Um, and, and that's one aspect of it. So with some of the conversations that you're having, even potentially some of the closer networks that you have to the business, 
and even stakeholders. Um, some of these news and, 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 and press coverage that you get is enough to actually give people the confidence that, okay, you guys are the real deal and you're, you're worthy of my investment. So, um, so that's, that's pretty much um, how we leverage press um, through every other aspect. So emails, um, we use it with digital advertising, we use it with social organically. Um, and of course, when we're talking to investors, bigger investors, about plugging some of the traction that we're getting, not only from an investment perspective, but also from an external um, public relations um, aspect as well. So um, just to summarize this, because I, I, I'm tending to talk too much at each section here, but um, think about what's newsworthy. Like, think about three to four angles. Um, and, and I think we'll cover this in a section, uh, a, set, uh, a second where um, maybe get some advice, particularly um, journalists. And there is a lot of journalists, unfortunately, out there at the moment that uh, are in a position that can actually dedicate some time to potentially giving you advice on what angles that you should use, particularly for each of the key um, industries or uh, audience opportunities that you, you may want to pitch to. And um, we um, you, you can pitch yourself. And in some cases, we've had feedback that it's it's better to be a founder that's on the front foot with, with some of this coverage and being the one that's being persistent to, to hopefully get something covered. So, uh, and we give that advice as well. Like we, we provide as part of our, even our checklists, we give some guides and templates and examples and, and, and potentially even ways to pitch to, to journalists. So, um, so it's, as you can see, if you do a search for virtual and, and Google news, you'll, you'll see, um, hopefully a good indication of, of where um, our, our companies have, have got coverage. And that leads me to back to Robin again. Yeah. Um, and uh, I suppose just um, talking about expertise, I'd say, because I did cover um, about engaging um, uh, freelancers or, or outsourcing certain aspects of your campaign. Um, do you want to maybe just go through some of the expertise that you may need to engage with as part of this marketing campaign? Yeah. Absolutely. I think um, a lot of people do ask the question, should I be engaging with other people to help me with the promotional aspects of my equity crowdfunding ca campaign? And it really comes down to your position um, in a number of different aspects. But I do feel like when it comes to the content and social media, you should be doing all of this yourself if you can. Now, if that means you are doing it personally, or if you're bringing somebody into the team to handle this, I think that that should be managed in-house. If you're outsourcing the messaging and key messaging of your business, then I think it's probably not gonna get done to a degree that you are very comfortable with and you feel very proud of that you are behind that messaging itself. You've got to be consistent. Even if you are outsourcing this, you have to drive the messaging and, and key vision of your business. So in-house wherever possible. But when it comes to content, your pitch video, which you prepare for equity crowdfunding, uh, it really does pay off to get somebody to help you out with this. A videographer, there are a number of key videographers who have done great videos for campaigns that we have worked on and we can always recommend those individuals and we will absolutely um, recommend some of those individuals for you depending on where you are based. But when it comes to campaign updates, as I mentioned before, with the likes of Outland Denim, we've seen Zirali do them, we've seen some other recent campaigns, for instance, Geek Super, which is closing out tonight, they've done three great updates. It's just a very short uh, update on the business and the traction and the scarcity of getting into the business itself. And that is always better on video than it is in text. So by all means, do as much as you can in house. And then when it comes to press, you've already touched on this one, Alan, so you've probably covered a bit of it. But I think um, the, the strategy that we can see has worked very, very well for other companies is actually outsourcing the press release. So asking um, somebody to help you put this press release together and teasing out what story is there that your business can really get some traction with. And then when it comes to pitching, doing this yourself 
can be time consuming, but it's really, really effective. And so what I would encourage everybody to do is to actually, if you haven't already, start building a list, an Excel spreadsheet of all the journalists within your industry who are writing similar stories. If you, if you have a number of keywords that actually apply to your industry, go on Google Alerts and, and, and put those keywords in those industries. So then you're getting notifications when these articles are coming out within your region, get that journalist, get those emails, and then start to build a list of people to go out to. I promise it will really pay off dividends if you do that work yourself, and actually pitch yourself. And then when it comes to advertising, I think that there's a level of which it depends on how much you're looking to raise and how much you can actually put into the business, uh, the advertising yourself. If you've got maybe two to three thousand dollars throughout the whole campaign itself, it will be much better for you to learn how to use Facebook ads yourself. And it's something like Alan has said, because we're doing it so frequently, we can help you with that. Um, to get you started, but there's a number of resources out there to really help you get across this. Um, and budget comes into it, raise target comes into it. So if you're looking to raise a substantial amount of money, then it's always usually advised that you do bring on some external help because you're going to be managing so much, so much else and hopefully trying to manage the operations of the capital raise itself as well. But what I will leave everybody with on this area in particular, is that when you are outsourcing, do make sure that you still know the basics of some of what's going on here. We can still help you with this because we're doing this so regularly. But if you hand over all the advertising for um, your equity crowdfunding raise and you've never done it for your business before, then it's, it's gonna be really difficult to know if somebody who's handling it is actually doing a good job of it. So it's always worthwhile to sit aside, take an hour, watch a few videos so you understand how it works, try it out for yourself first, and then bring on some outside help. So I would encourage everybody to even, you know, advertise some of the basic elements on their website and start to build an email list, perhaps by offering something like a, a free product if they sign up to your email list of something like that, if you haven't already started doing that yourself. Um, I'm going to hand up, ask Alan if there's anything else that we should perhaps cover, but that actually brings us towards the end, which I've dropped our emails down at the bottom there, and we're going to switch over to the Q&As right now, but I'd love to just ask Alan if there's anything else that uh, you feel we should leave everybody else with uh, when it comes to getting prepared. Um, no, I, I think just to summarize, just I think in terms of um, the process that we've refined um, over the years, um, and we, we covered the four key areas. Like there is some details probably that we haven't been able to cover in this half hour, but in terms of getting the insight into how we work, I think it's best to get in touch with, with one, of, one of us. Uh, and also just to understand from the stage of where you're at at the moment, what it may take to actually be ready uh, to, to be open for equity crowdfunding. Um, clearly, we have had some huge successes with companies that are maybe a later stage in, in terms of startup, maybe at series A stage, have got really good traction with customers and things. But like we are stage agnostic um, and at every stage of, of, of like preparing equity crowdfunding, we can work with you in terms of, of getting, it, getting you ready to actually open an offer and give you the guidance of where we think that offer will, will end up. Um, particularly after your EOI campaign, so that we're not taking risks and in, in, in not being successful with a raise. We're not taking risks of not being able to raise capital for your business subsequently. Um, and, and also preparing you um, as a company to take on potentially hundreds or even thousands of investors. Um, that may be scary for people, but it is a huge opportunity. And it's, it's something that I think only companies that are being successful now will be able to really see the, the true benefits of um, in a few years time. Um, Robin, you have the, I suppose, the, the foresight of, of being able to see what potentially this, how valuable this is for, for companies and particularly the consumer companies in Australia. So um, I, I just like to say, yeah, like you're, you're in good hands in terms of the process and, and the experience of the team. And we'll give you a lot more insight into 
the day-to-days of, of what it takes to, to be successful, I see, with, with this model and, and using virtual as well. So, um, but yeah, let's open Absolutely. up more questions, yeah. Yeah, so we're just gonna uh, stop the share and we'll switch over to the Q and A's. Um, I haven't actually gone through these because I don't wanna come off the share, but I'm just gonna stop this now and come over to the Q and A's here. So if you haven't asked the question, it doesn't matter what it is, please do go ahead and ask this question here. So one of the first questions here from Matt, is there any benefit to having a longer EOI period based on your experience? Actually, I do have a personal experience with this where a company did actually decide to extend their EOI period. Uh, actually, you know what, I will answer live. Um, so they did decide to extend their EOI period over the Christmas break because their numbers weren't quite where they needed to be. And the thing is, is once you extend that period over, we agreed to make sure that we were actually sending those EOIs an email every single two weeks to keep them updated with what was going on in the business, give them good news. But when it actually came around to opening the investment offer, the EOI had been live for almost, it was potentially just over two months at that point, And the conversion was well below where we actually wanted it to be. So what we truly want to be able to do is get you ready to launch your EOI and have a really strong four weeks. If we've opened up the EOI and we've lost a week at the start and we haven't gone out and done some really strong promotion, I think that we're losing um, time here and, and really valuable time because the people who have expressed interest on day one, when they have to wait four weeks for the investment offer to open, it's, it's quite a long time. So I think that there's always a benefit to actually having um, potentially even a three, sometimes a two week EOI can be beneficial. If you're prepared and you've got really good comms going out, I think that there can always be a, a good, it, it, it can always be a good idea to have a, a, a succinct expression of interest period. Um, I would just add as well, there's one aspect I think that we, we didn't mention actually as part of the offer period, uh, which is the, the private offer period. Um, and generally we open immediately after the EOI to a, a private period where we invite anybody that has, has expressed interest and, and providing them potentially some incentives to get in or there. Um, we can provide a, an incentive in terms of a share price re uh, reduction, but mm -hmm. uh, we, we aim to invite these people as, as part of the EOI process in at the start to get that momentum. And it's one of the main success factors of equity crowdfunding as well and when the offer opens. So getting early momentum and hitting targets. So I, I think one aspect and one of the key aspects that I think that I've been I've learned most I say this year and particularly through this period is that you set dates and targets and you stick to them. I think and if you do stick to them, keep a very short campaign, three weeks, um, you finish and you launch when you say you are and you launch publicly yeah. um, immediately after your private periods when you said you would, um, you have a much higher success rate I say from, from the entire campaign. So. Um, I may sound like the a traditional investor, but um, set dates, targets, deadlines, and keep to them, and you will yep. be successful with it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, let's go uh, back to the questions here. Um, thanks, Matt. We've got another one from you. Are there any plans to affiliate opportunities to encourage media and influencers to share? We do have this for investment. Um, when it comes to referring a company as well, we do have this. Um, we've, we've actually promoted it quite heavily, although we do still get um, asked this question quite frequently. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny that you ask this because we've got an invite link on each individual campaign where people can share that with their audiences. It tracks signups, it tracks investment, and then that individual ends up receiving 30% of our fee that we take on success. But um, it, it, it's potentially something that we need to look at um, the, the, you know, the, the actual UX of a, an investor because of the fact that uh, we do get asked this quite often um, and uh, it's, it's there, it's in place. It's a great backend system. You can track it from your own portfolio, but um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, perhaps it's just not well uh, communicated enough on our platform. 
Um, then we've got Boris who's asked what is the size of an average backer investment. This is a really, this is a really, really common question that we get asked. And I would actually say that if you look at the average size of the backer investment, the average, I mean, the, the averages fall between around about 1500 um, to maybe 3000 sometimes even lower than 1500 when companies like Zerali decide that they want as many investors as possible and they want to cap their maximum investment. But this isn't actually the metric that we feel decides the number, the largest number of investors, because what you end up having is you have so many people who fit below a thousand dollars and then you have a lot, then you want to really target and go after people who are investing 10,000, 20,000 or 50,000 perhaps. Um, and they will be uncovered to you during the expression of interest campaign, as you can see who they are and they will let you know if they are sophisticated or if they don't know, potentially highlighting that they're new to early stage investment. But um, when it comes to the average investment size, that actually just is a combination of this. But what you'll find is that the majority of investors are around about the thousand dollar to five hundred dollar mark, um, and you'll have a lot of people who will come in at your minimum investment amount as well. So, um, yeah, it 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 really um, you you will find that what you want to be able to do is get your digital advertising very aligned with being able to make it cost effective for you to bring on some of those smaller investors. Would you say that answers about everything on that, Alan? Um, yeah, I would say um, sometimes the audience of, you, of your customer base has an impact as this. So if your target market for your product is pretty high end, the average ISA has tended to go up. I think if your product is, is quite low end or their audience for your product and service is, is, is maybe to uh, an audience that has less dispensable income, um, we, we do see a, maybe a drop off on that. So I think, think about uh, the, the, your customer base as well as an audience. Um, I'll maybe cover the next question as well. I said, what's the usual conversion of EOI to investor? Um, again, this varies quite a bit and we have talked about the timing and keeping to targets. I think that's a, um, I think they go hand in hand in terms of the relationship of conversion to keeping to the time frame, so of, of three weeks, two to three weeks of, of an EOI. So I think we've seen up to about 60% conversion from EOI to offer. However, it, it does fall probably below that, probably below 50% typically um, for companies that do, I suppose, follow that process. Again, it's much lower. If, for example, you've run a 10 week EOI. Yeah. Yep, that's absolutely right. And our platform really has, has crunched these numbers for you because we've done all this data analysis this year um, and we're constantly refining it. So I think, yeah, that covers just about everything. But please do follow up if you want more detail. Um, just going down to the next question, um, I'd like more information or clarification on what virtual does for the businesses seeking funding. Is This is in light of fees and the percentage of virtual, which virtual receives. Um, what do you do for companies and does it change depending on your percentage? So our fee structure is very simple in the regard that we charge a $900 EOI fee, which we put into digital advertising. We charge um, just under $2,000 as an admin and offer document review fee, but we haven't covered the offer document um, and that aspect of this raise just on this webinar for the purposes of keeping it strictly promotional. Um, so what we want to um, really highlight. But any, anyway, I'll just get back to the fees, which is 6% on success of funding. And for anybody who's actually gone through this process will tell us, will tell you that we are well, well in, indebted um, in the process until we get to that 6%. We spent a significant amount of time um, and money ourselves to try and get you to that stage of being successful. So the $900 EOI fee, which we charge for digital advertising, we more or less always go over that. Um, but when it does come to promoting your campaign, we will promote your campaign through digital advertising through our own platform. We'll send out your campaign through our newsletter, which is over 40,000 um, as a database strong now. Um, then we push you out as far and wide as we can. And we're constantly trying to uncover the right ways to get um, 
as, as many of the right type of investors as possible. And so what we really want to be able to do for you is as Alan was kind of really explaining earlier is not only um, find you investors, but also at the same time, create some really positive and good exposure for your business. So in the digital advertising that we're pushing out, we do see that, but a lot of the time, what we're doing is, is checking in with you that we are getting everything right. And so we, I guess we, we really adopt the fact that your raise is important, as important to us um, as it is to you. And so that's really aligned in our fee structure, which, you know, charging less than $3,000 to get to the point of being live, we feel is very fair um, and, and very reasonable in the current market. Is there anything else you'd like to add, add Alan? Um, no, I, I think we're, uh, <laughs> we're taking right. too long over these questions. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> anyway, no, no, I think like a, you get access to a campaign manager like Robin um, or me or, or one of the team members as to, is helping you guide that through that process. So it's, it's hands on experience and, and success. I think that's the key value yeah, of, of working with us. Right. So, um, awesome. okay. Question. I think looking at, uh, the, uh, like at least Armstrong asking about will we cover a legal framework session like this? Um, I think we are likely I say to do a similar session just to cover off, um, the key aspects. Um, of preparing an offer. And there's two key documents with that. Um, one is the offer document that we mentioned. Um, and the other one is preparing legal documents. For example, your company constitution. So um, offer document, you, you will ask um, probably what details in terms of financials you'll need to, to have available for the offer as well. And that will hopefully be covered in this session. Otherwise, um, check out um, the, the website, um, even setting up a company and looking at our get started guide will give you some insight into um, examples and also the template that's uh, provided through ASIC in terms of the regulated documents so um, we'll not cover it too much today so but it's a good question to ask um, another question is um, uh, what is EOI uh, go I've just got go one metric. above actually Alan which is from right. Sam which is what the typical advertising spend is as a percentage of raise amount um, and because we've already done this analysis, I think this is a really good one to, to answer. Um, so just answering this one live, Sam, uh, I, I, I think that um, we've actually done the analysis on all of the companies which raised um, up until the very end of 2019. And we could see that every company spent around about, it was between 0 0.7 and 2% of their total, av total raise amount on digital advertising. So um, that I, I think represents a hugely, uh, hugely valuable return on investment for actually putting those funds into digital advertising. And so some companies who have managed to spend, you know, 0.7% have had very engaged communities. And even some who've had very engaged communities have actually seen um, the, you know, the, the spend go up to 2% because of the fact that they really want to get that brand exposure for their business. And when they're getting press, they want to push that out. And even, even if that doesn't convert as well, it provides ex really significant exposure for the business. So um, anywhere between 0.7%, I think if you're spending less than 1% to raise your total amount, then perhaps you should have considered to spend more because at the end of the day, your investment offer is only live for a short period of time. And you have that opportunity to be able to raise funds from these people who you're advertising your business to. So I, I always think that um, put in as much as you can where it's converting. Um, and then what is the EOI go slash no go uh, metrics and target? Now, this is an interesting question because of the fact that um, we can potentially have an EOI no go um, with regards to metrics and the target for the business itself. And, when it comes to the EOI conversion to investment offer, the EOIs will typically come in and they, they express their interest and they give you a minimum parcel and a maximum parcel. And what we do is we consolidate that data. So then we have a minimum and a maximum. And usually com companies actually end up closing around about 60 to 80% of what the minimum consolidated number is. Some have raised more than what the minimum consolidated number is, but in most instances, companies fit between that bracket. 
So therefore, if a company is saying to us, they need to raise 500,000, and that consolidated data, which is all on the dashboard for you for your particular EOI raise, is telling us that you're only going to be able to raise 70,000 max, and we've, we've been running the EOI for four weeks. That represents that there's not enough key structure and grounding to promote your business effectively, and w w we simply haven't got where we need to get to. So I think rather than letting an EOI run for four weeks, we really try to call this early. Um, although we give as much guidance as possible to try and run a successful EOI, we do try and call this early. So I don't think you would go any more than 10, 10 days, for instance, um, with an EOI without us calling it early and suggesting that actually, you know, you, you go away and work on X, Y, and Z before you run an EOI to try and raise this, or you consider um, your raise target and what you're looking to do as a business. Um, Alan, would you like to answer the next question, which is from Peter Stone? Um, could you maybe read it out as thick as my screen keeps on? Yeah, sure, sure. Hiding, hiding the first one. Yeah. yeah, sure. So, Peter, um, my business will not be located just in Australia. Is that an issue for local investors? Are we likely to reach US investors? Um, so, one of the eligibility tests is that the company needs to be in Australia um, and you need to company directors as a minimum to actually raise through the Australian regulated um, CSF regulations. So um, yeah, so that will be a restriction in terms of accessing international investors. Um, like it's, it's really up to the investors to consider um, and, and get advice potentially on whether they can invest into Australian companies, if, if that's part of your question here as well. So. Um, and maybe not cover too much in detail about the eligibility, but we do have an eligibility test on the website in terms of uh, who can who can invest, who can uh, raise raise through the platform. Yep, great. Um, and the next question, which I'll cover, which is from Paul. So, if you receive hundreds of small thousand dollar investors, how often should you be updating them? Is it a concern that we may need to keep in contact with many people? Good question. This gets asked a lot. So if you're getting all these different investors on board, then I think you know we've got a number of share registry providers, which we actually work with, which we strongly encourage every business to sign up to at the end of the process. And what those share registry providers will help you with is making sure that you're getting your filings on time, um, making sure that you're communicating effectively with your shareholders. Um, and in the regime, you have to communicate twice a year to that. Uh, twice a year to your shareholders um, and you have to file a report and update the shareholders and provide them with an access to that. But we would actually recommend just sending them brief updates at least once a quarter. I think that's pretty subjective in some people's circumstances because I, I've, I, I know that Alan yourself, you've mentioned once a month before and I think it comes down to the business itself because if you're updating uh, if you have shareholders in any instance in your business, you have to be updating them pretty regularly. Um, whereas with these small shareholders, what you will find is that there's an advantage to a number of them only owning a thousand dollars in shares in the sense that they won't likely come back to you and um, cause you too many headaches. Obviously that's not the case for every single raise. Um, there might be a couple who, who really just would love to have a chat with you, but at the end of the day, you send out emails to these through the share register, these investors through the share registry um, provider that you choose to actually go with, and and that way you can always keep them informed. I am um, obviously a shareholder in a number of these different businesses, and I personally love just seeing a quarterly update with the financials, what's going on in the business, what worked, what didn't work. I never need to know any more because they've already provided a really strong update. So, um, I personally think that once a quarter is always good practice. Um, I, I'll just add as well, um, the, the, the registries uh, is a pretty competitive space at the moment. So it's, it's pretty competitive in terms of pricing for these services. So yeah. uh, don't be too concerned about having to go to computer share or some of the big listed registry providers to provide that as a service. So and it's, um, and it's, it's, it's something that we would, uh, as, as Robin mentioned, recommend. Um, I had another question on the impacts of COVID 
Yeah. Um, yeah. From and Liz. yeah, so this is uh, like like we've been obviously campaign management managing these campaigns over this period as well, and that we have been very successful. I said probably the only platform that has been putting up successful deals and, and getting deals away during this period. Um, what we're seeing is that retail investment um, has not been significantly affected um, at this stage. Um, we, we may be seeing a, a change in terms of larger investors engaging with the offers, but I think we have been successful at navigating um, this and also setting targets based on some of these conversations as well. So I think in terms of um, the, the true impact of um, the, uh, the times that we're in, um, the, we're not seeing um, significant impact in terms of putting away deals from large numbers of investors. So um, obviously I think some industries are going to be impacted more in terms of the perception of putting an offer live at the moment, but we have these discussions uh, very early on. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we always look to see how um, the, I suppose the, the narrative for any investment opportunity um, at the moment. So um, obviously there's some companies that are doing well and doing particularly well during this period. And, and it does make for a compelling story. Um, and a big part of that story as well is, is quite important as well. So um, I think it's, it's something that we can discuss if it's something that you're concerned about. But otherwise, um, we, we feel like it, times have um, progressed. Um, like the the changes have have like we we feel like the things have, are turning around, and we've definitely seen in the last two weeks um, a significant change in in maybe some of the uh, the the results and even the conversions that we're seeing uh, through each of the campaigns. So, um, so it's it's very positive from our end. Um, there was a period of, of uh, a bit of uncertainty in, in terms of how it's impacting us, but generally, I think it's uh, we've, we've turned a corner. So, yeah, absolutely. And I just have a couple of comments to just continue from there. I think that startups are in a really unique position because of the fact that they can adapt and change much quicker um, than a lot of corporations who are out there who are raising significant funds, um, and that gives yourself yourselves as startups a very good and compelling story the state that you only need to raise a very small amount in comparison and actually you can potentially achieve um, you know half of what they're looking to achieve so I think that there's a, a very compelling story for startups and I think that um, people are still out there in the market looking for good deals and so we we recognize that um, and companies are out there and really um, advisor ratings who raised uh, you know at the well not not that long ago actually um, raised at a discount round just to um, provide themselves with some working capital and in nine days managed to raise 200k from their investors last year. So that was a really successful round um, and we are still seeing that there's appetite from some of these investors. Um, we just got one last question which is from Sam. Um, do, you find the, do you find the total percentage of company offered has any bearing on the success of the campaign? Like I've alluded to um, in in the um, valuation, it's always coming up in every single round itself. Um, and so it, it, it's always going to have a, um, you know, a bearing on the success of the capital raise itself. And the best advice I can always give to any company which is going through this process is that if you haven't had a conversation with any of the larger ticket potential investors around the price of the valuation, I don't want you to go live because of the fact that if the largest, if the largest check holder and the largest ticket size and investor hasn't agreed to your valuation, then how can you get everybody else to come in and agree to the valuation when actually getting that lead investor is so important to the success of the campaign. And if I was coming into a round and I was looking to invest a thousand dollars and somebody else had invested a hundred thousand who is going to, always do more due diligence on the company itself and they are happy and comfortable with the valuation. Most people will come in to these rounds off the basis that other people have actually gone in and done that work and had that discussion around the valuation. 
So the biggest ticket holders are your keys to unlocking your success with the right valuation here. Um, it's what we encourage every single company to do before they go down this route. And I know you'll probably have a couple of comments to add onto that as well, Alan. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, like we, we've done a blog post on this very recently. And uh, like, uh, if, you haven't, if you don't have, I suppose, larger investors to turn to in terms of valuation, um, which is a slightly separate question to maybe the, the percentage of, of what you're offering in the company as well. But um, yeah, I think you need to get external advice or at least be able to demonstrate that you've done the research in terms of valuing the business. Um, and, and how you valued it, what valuation method you've used. And, and we do uh, refer to a service online that we, as a, a partner of this service, provide a discount as well too, to, to uh, give you guidance on that valuation. And it's, for a founder, it's, it's actually worth doing it um, for yourself to know uh, where you sit in terms of plugging in what your uh, forecasts and financial projections are. So. Um, yeah, so I think that's that pretty much uh, wraps us up. Is that right, Robert? Pretty much wraps <laughs> us up. Um, and look, that's the end of the questions. I think uh, it's been it's been you know great to see such such detailed questions come through. I'm really pleased uh, that uh, we were able to offer this session and answer some of these questions. Thanks very much to, to you guys for staying to the end. Um, but I think um, yeah, look, it's 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 uh, an interesting time. Um, but at any point, we really want to be able to just serve yourselves and whatever position you're in. So if you're unsure, reach out to myself or Alan. We'll have a chat with you um, and we'd love to be able to help prepare you to raise capital for your business. So, yeah. All right. I think you're, you're on mute, Alan. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. All uh, right. Thanks, thanks, thanks guys. Uh, Bye-bye. Take care.